Okay, so um, we'll we'll be um, starting actually on the book of Jeremiah tonight, and uh, I would suggest that as we're doing this study, you guys try and read along in Jeremiah if you really want to get more out of it, and I would all no throughout the weeks. I mean, oh. like throughout the weeks, so like this this next week, and I'll say it at the at the end again. But I would suggest reading Jeremiah chapter two and three. Um, and then besides that, I would also suggest that you read um, those the last half of Second Kings and Second Chronicles like we talked about last week to really get the full idea. Um, so Jeremiah 1, 1 through 3. And I use mostly the NIV and the CSB for this, um, for these different readings. Um, so the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So a little bit dry here, but that's uh, kind of sets up the, um, gives us a setting of the book, which is what we talked about last week with the different, you know, historical things that are going on. And all of chapter one of Jeremiah is going to give us a good, um, basically chapter one of Jeremiah is going to completely set the stage for everything that follows in the next in the next 51 chapters after it the the first chapter completely like uh, introduces the whole book and uh, it says here uh the um in the ter territory of benjamin the nation of israel um was uh, divided among the 12 tribes of israel and one of those tribes was the tribe of benjamin uh, which was located in central israel where jerusalem was and that's when you see in the bible it talks about different territories that's what it's talking about uh, and then the second thing I wanted to mention about with this first part, since we really looked at this last week, um, is it says the word of the Lord that came to him in the 13th year. Um, the Lord is a translation of uh, Yahweh. Uh, it's not uh, the generic God or El. It is um, Yahweh specifically mentioned. Uh, so then uh, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Um, so this this kicks off the first of his prophecies that is recorded, which means it's in about 627. And um, this is probably the single greatest verse that people use for um, the for the um, argument against uh, abortion. Um, and I, once again, I want to mention about how, uh, as a prophet, he got these words that came through God's revelation, not soul searching. It wasn't like he just wanted something, you know, there. Um, so the, if you notice here, um, God's very specific to set up Jeremiah's ministry with just kind of these prophecies, these uh, promises and stuff that he's going to depend on throughout the course of his of his ministry. And the first thing I want to mention here is how he says this: "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you." So first off, God's calling is not flippant, last minute, unplanned. It's not something that he just oh, well, I mean, I, I didn't really plan for you to be there, and I, now that you're there, I mean, I guess it just so happens that you perfectly fit in this um, in this thing here. You know, and God, and God's God's planning for us goes, goes beyond that. Now, unfortunately, though, and for a lot of us, we spend most of our life looking for a big thing to make us kind of justify our existence. Like, oh, that what, what's that big thing that I want to do with my life? But really, this is not a very helpful mindset to have as a Christian because God has lots of stuff through your whole years. And just because your prime is gone doesn't mean that God's purpose in your life is gone. So really, it's not about finding a big thing in your life like that. Oh, that that. Oh, this is what I. This is my purpose in life. It's more about God being number one in your life, and uh, and about obeying Him with things. Um, it, it, the thing is, with God, if you obey Him in little things, you'll find that those those little things are actually just as important as the big things. Like in our mind, we, we, we make these things like, oh, this is the big thing that I'm supposed to do with my life. But God doesn't really see it like that. God sees it as everything that you do in your life when you obey him and you honor him. Th those little things are big things, things that maybe nobody else uh, you know, praises you for or gives you attention for, but still those are really important. Um, and also I want to get across the point that you know our lives, our lives are created with purpose, not for a purpose, not like there's one thing in your life that, you know, that one thing. Once you do that one thing, you're, you're just going to go die or something. But our lives are created with purpose. Our very existence has purpose to it. Um, past whatever your plans or your goals are for your life, God has made your life with purpose. And if your life doesn't go how you want, th that's okay because it's not about that finding a purpose in your life. It's about how you have been created with purpose. 
Um, obviously, uh, so then that takes us to this um, in in verse in verse um, five here. He says, "I guess it's uh, no, it is five. Before I formed you in the womb." So God is directly uh, claiming there that He is the one who personally is making us in the womb. You know, obviously He uses um, He uses you know intercourse, sex, to to make us or whatever. But before we are created in the womb, God is still. Um, God is still the one who's behind our existence. Just because he's using tools, I guess you could say, you know, for those who are in high school and giggling, <laughs> uh, just because he uses certain tools doesn't mean that um, he's not behind, the one behind it. So he says three different things. He says, I formed you, I knew you, and I pointed you. So let's look at that. First off, I knew you. I knew you, in English, it doesn't really translate that well because you think, um, it's kind of like oh, knowledge of a person, like oh, God knows who I am. It's it goes beyond that. It's more of more of an intimate closeness um, and a commitment to. Like God is completely, completely dedicated to us, and like He knew our existence before our mom and dad ever, ever even knew each other. Like He, 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 He knew us. It's 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 hard to. It's hard to really get across what the Hebrew is really saying here. But it's more than just a, a knowledge of somebody existing. The second thing that he says is set apart. Now, this is um, what in English we use the word holy. Um, the idea is something that is dedicated to a purpose, something that is set apart to be used for something. And Yahweh says that he specifically set apart Jeremiah for a task that he dedicated him for his pur for his purposes. So his life, Jeremiah's life was not his own. His life was um, was surrendered to God's. Now, and in, in in to a degree, this is true of all Christians, but it's not in the same same way. So obviously, you know, God doesn't want us to be miserable in life, but He does own us as Christians. And then the third thing He says, so I knew you, I set you apart. The third thing was I appointed you. And um, the Hebrew is a lot more emphatic than the English can get it, can get across. Um, but obviously, I can't really talk too much about the Hebrew tonight. Uh, the idea appointed, um, it's, uh, this one's kind of the, the most simple of the three, the three uh, verbs, I guess you could say, that he's using here. It's more of just a special, unique thing given to him. So, like, it's not something that we are all appointed to. It is specifically, um, you know, he was appointed specifically as a prophet. So, so what, what are the differences between Jeremiah the prophet and us as Christians? And how do those differences, um, you know, what, 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 what's a big difference between us? So first off, we are all known by God before birth. That's, that's true of all Christians. Um, or all people, I guess, and, and if you want to take it even that, even that for, for everybody is known by God before they're even born, before they're conceived in the womb, God knows you know, knows people. He he is not that we have existed before heaven, but before our point of, ex of 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 creation, God knew that we would exist. And whereas Jeremiah, we are not all, all guaranteed the same promises as Jeremiah had. So Jeremiah receives certain promises at the book of what God's going to do in his life that are not true for all Christians. God is connect and committed to His church, and He will rescue us ultimately in heaven. You know, obviously there's things like martyrs and stuff, um, but. Um, but Jeremiah, on the other hand, was promised personally earthly protection. So he was promised that, you know, while he is doing his ministry that God has called him to, that God will literally intervene to make sure that he does not, um, uh, he is not killed. Yeah, he's not killed by these people who are opposing him. Um, he set us apart for salvation. Yes, that's that's true of every of all the Christians. But he hasn't set us all apart necessarily for a big thing necessarily, but for good works generally speaking. And like I say. When we do good works for God's kingdom, it's not like that's any less important than having this one big thing that you're called to. So uh, some good examples of this would be like um, adopting uh, adopting a kid who doesn't have a family. That would be a good work that somebody could do. Gracie is actually working on a um, care package for the CYFD offices to give to foster kids that will give them different, you know, um, health things that they will need. Um, and not, not health things. This is called... Um, you know, like a bathroom, um, 
personal hygiene items. That's what it's called. Yes, personal hygiene items uh, for for the kids. Now, see that that's a good example of a good work. It might not be something that she gets you know fame for or something, but it's a good work that we can all do. So once you get away from the idea of oh, I have to find that purpose for my life, that 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 one job, that you know that that dream person I'm supposed to marry or that dream place I'm supposed to live. Once you get rid of that and just see your life as more of a blessing and a series of choices that you can make, it relieves a lot of pressure, especially when you're younger. You know, you start thinking that, you know, what if I miss it? What if I, you know, don't, you know, fulfill that one thing or get that dream thing? Oh, I'll screw up my whole life. And it's not really like that. Um, so then next off, number four, we are holy to the Lord as Christians. That's absolutely true as Christ of all Christians. But Jeremiah was holy to a specific task of being a prophet. We are appointed heirs and ambassadors of Christ, which is what Paul mentions, but he was appointed as a prophet. So hopefully that kind of helps you see some of the differences between the between that passage where God is saying, I, you know, I knew you, I formed, I uh, appointed you, and all that. So the next two verses, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young, because you will go to everyone I send you to, and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. So uh, right here it says, do not be afraid of them. Who's the them? Uh, it's whoever he, he sends he sends Jeremiah to. So um, all the people that, that, that God sends Jeremiah to, he never has to be afraid of, of them. <clears throat> so it starts off with Jeremiah's retort, which is not uh, or refusal or excuse or whatever you want to say, which isn't actually that uncommon um, throughout the Bible and even you know nowadays when, when God calls us to something it's very common to kind of feel inadequate, inadequate, um, unqualified. And the reason for Jeremiah's feeling of inadequacy were, were twofold. Um, he said that he he didn't know how to speak, so he was inexperienced. And then also he said that he was he was a youth that he was he was too young. He didn't know what the heck he's. I mean, it, think about how what it must have been like to be him, you know, to approach kings and and all these you know crowds of people. And I was like, well, what do I possibly have to offer, you know, in, in the way of this? I mean, I'm I have nothing to prove myself. You know, people don't even know me. So God's answer was was, was threefold, and I'll try to. I'll try to help you understand what I'm saying. God's first answer was that um, Jeremiah would gain experience by doing it. He only had to be faithful. You know, hey, don't say I'm too young because you're 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 going to go everywhere I send you to. So he's going to get experience by doing it. And God's second answer was that Jeremiah would be able to do what God was calling him to to, to do. Um, not necessarily that he had to do it. That it's not it's not like it's a threat necessarily it might have been partially a threat but also um, the idea that hey it's going to happen this this thing that, that, that i'm calling you to you're not doomed to failure you're going to get it done do not say i'm too young because you will go to everyone i send you to and say whatever i command you to you, you're, you're gonna you're gonna succeed and then god's third uh, answer to his to his excuse was he didn't have to be experienced because god was going was guiding him and telling him what to say jeremiah didn't have to have the answers he says here um, you will go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you to. So it doesn't matter how unqualified or how inexperienced or how young, because I'm going to be the one who's telling you the words. I'm going to be the one who's guiding your steps. And, you know, there's really nothing really to worry about. And there's a saying that people say is God doesn't uh, call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Well, that's not exactly true. God doesn't just call the qualified, but he does call the qualified. Um, in fact, if you want to be used by God, what good stopping, starting point is to uh, train your your natural talents, like you know, if you're talented in music or speaking or that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so God doesn't just call the qualified; He calls qualified or not. Whether you're qualified or not, it doesn't matter. God calls a lot of people. Um, but I do want to mention one thing that there's kind of an over overarching theme in the Bible, and that's the idea that disobedience to God to God's calling brings the thing that is feared. A good example of this would be um, when Israel is getting ready to go into the Promised Land, and so you know God says, "Hey, you guys uh, go on into the Promised Land. I'm going to guide you and direct you and all that stuff." And then so God says, or so then they say, "Well, we don't really want to go because." Our children might get hurt. So then it says, okay, if you're not going to go, your children will be the one who go into the promised land, and you'll be the ones who don't. So like the thing that they were afraid of happening was, you know, exactly the thing that happened to them by not obeying God. I mean, that happens throughout, all, all throughout Scripture. Oh, I, I don't want to go into ministry because I don't want, I want to enjoy my life. I want to, you know, have good things that happen. I don't want to spend all my life in that kind of stuff. It's just boring crap. I don't want, I don't want to do that. And then somehow. You know, that thing that you were afraid of happening by you getting into ministry happens in life anyways. 
Um, another thing I, uh, that is important to mention here, um, he says here, um, do not be afraid of them for I am with you and, and, will, and will rescue you. Um, prophets were not responsible for their audience's reaction. Their success as a prophet was in their own obedience to God, not in whether or not the audience listened to them. Um, this might not seem important overall now, but as you get older and you get into more church stuff and whatnot, and, and maybe into your whatever occupation you choose as an adult and all that, it, it quickly becomes oh, very encouraging. <laughs> So the task definitely seems too big to Jeremiah, his youth, his inexperience, the problems he would face. And, and that's actually something that's pretty interesting. He never actually mentioned, hey, God, I don't want to do this because I'm going to be dealing with a lot of problems. And yet God still said, hey, don't be afraid of them. Like he, he already knew, you know, what was in Jeremiah's heart. So even though it was unspoken, you know, he was still able to, hey, you know, give you some encouragement here. So the, the important thing about uh, verses 7 through 9 that, that I want you, to get, want you to get is if Jeremiah would not have known about God's leading with him. Israel's rejection of not just of Jeremiah, but also of his prophecies and, and what he was doing, his ministry, it would have seemed like an unbearable pain, like a constant failure for him, like an insurmountable task, um, something that would have weighed him down. And and so he, God told him this, this prophecy at the very beginning of his ministry, so you have something to look back on and lean on. Um, so Paul, Jeremiah wasn't doing it for attention. He wasn't doing it because he was bored. He wasn't doing it because he wanted to. He saw himself as a speaker of a tradition, one of, of a many spoked wheel, um, trying to progress God's uh, calling. And uh, as I said, this, this would, word would be definitely an encouragement for him in the years to come when things didn't work out how he wanted, and doubts inevitably came. So, um, how was God with Jeremiah? God says very specifically right here, I am with you and will rescue you. So the question becomes how? How, how is God with Jeremiah? Because if you read through the book, maybe you don't know, or maybe you aren't familiar with Jeremiah, so I'll just kind of break it up here. If you're familiar with the book, he gets ridiculed, opposed, arrested, thrown in a cistern, a cistern uh, openly you know, like ridiculed, and, 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 and people opposing him from from the prophets to the kings to the to the, uh, to the priesthood. Everybody's just kind of coming against him, and uh, it, it, it's just all this all this stuff. So the question becomes, how was God with Jeremiah? Because he did still go through crap. He his his he didn't go for victorious, and uh, he was still um, well persecuted and whatnot. And here's the thing: God being with Jeremiah doesn't mean that. Um, nothing bad happened to him. What it means is, it means a couple different things. First off, it means that God was with him through it, so he didn't have to go through it alone. That's more of a, a comfort in here. Mm -hmm. But then, um, even though the journey might be unpleasant, it was he could still know that God was the one who was guiding him down that down that path. He wasn't just stumbling through life, no matter how hopeless things seemed. Um, another thing is God promised to rescue Jeremiah from death as he did his jobs, not necessarily from all mistreatment or, or harm to his person, but rather from death. And we definitely do see that where there's a lot of people who are planning his, his demise and it doesn't it falls through because you know God's with him the whole time to rescue him. So God did not promise Jeremiah wouldn't die, okay, just not while he was still doing it doing, doing the job. And so Jeremiah prophesied, I mentioned last week, 40 years, and uh, then was was kind of dragged to Egypt where he probably died of old age. And we don't really know much after that. So verses 9 through 10. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So first off, Jeremiah didn't have to worry about not having the right words. I mean, if, if I was, I think if I was going to be a prophet, that would be my foremost concern is how, how will I know what to say? And God completely resolves that. He reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I put my words in your mouth. So problem solved. Um, he would do this by God's strength and not by his own, not by his own cleverness, not by any of that stuff. Um, this part here is actually a reference to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, um, right here. Then the Lord reached out and touched my hand, and I'll read you the passage I'm talking about. It says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So you can obviously see the, re the reference to, Deut to Deuteronomy there. But also, this was a common theme among the prophets, God touching the mouth and anointing someone for the, for the job. Isaiah, for instance, when he's having this heavenly vision, an angel takes a coal from, from heaven, and he touches Isaiah's lips on it, and uh, not this Isaiah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know that the whole 
touching the prophet's mouth is a common motive in uh, the biblical prophets. So he uses a series of, of, um, of terms here for what Jeremiah is going to do. He says, see today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. So let's look at those terms. First off, uproot and plant. These were farming terms. So, um, and then the, the, the other four terms used, destroy, demolish, build, and tear down, those are all architectural terms um, to kind of help Jeremiah to understand what he's doing. And so the question becomes, how? How is Jeremiah going to uproot and plant and destroy and demolish and all those things? How is he going to do that? Well, there's, there's five basic ways that Jeremiah was going to do that. First off, through the words of prophecy that he was giving, um, he would give uh, words of judgment and words of blessing. Which would obviously be, you know, uprooting and planting and destroying and <coughs> building and all that stuff. The second way is in the encouragement that Jeremiah gives, not not just um, us now, but all of his future hearers. You know, not just of that generation who wouldn't hear, but the next generation who would, and the generations who came after that among the Israelites and then among the Christians. Um, so that's that's two ways that Jeremiah um, planted. And then the third thing. God wouldn't move against the nations until after the words were given. Now, if you look right here with this with this thing, he says, Today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms. And so God was literally watching over and not he would not bring the destruction about to pass until Jeremiah gave the prophecy, and then he would start moving it forward. Um, so that's that's the third way that, that Jeremiah's prophecy was was demolishing and, and tearing down. Uh, number four, um, through the guidance that Jeremiah personally gave to the people, the, the different leaders and, and whatnot that he talked to, he, he gave them guidance and direction. And uh, so through that, through his talking to people, that was helping uh, to, to uproot and destroy and all that. So then the last way, the fifth way, Israel was literally exiled from their home and then returned. So I think that's a pretty good example of how they were uprooted from their home and how they were replanted in their home and how they were destroyed with all their different idols and, and, and demolished, but then still built up. Excuse me. So we see Jeremiah, um, you know, uprooting and destroying and all that. We see him doing it nationally, personally, and religiously. So when we read that, see, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to plant and to build, or to plant and to build and to plant. We see the basis of the entirety of what's going to follow in Jeremiah. So the next question becomes, well, why doesn't Jeremiah just not speak and then the bad things won't happen? I mean, if, if God's waiting to do the things until the prophet speaks, why doesn't he just not speak? Well, whenever people try to outsmart God um, in the Bible and, and elsewhere, it never really works. And... Uh, you know, Jeremiah even said that at one point in his ministry that he, he didn't want to prophesy anymore. But if he kept his mouth shut, it would be like a consuming fire within him. So he, was, he wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so the, the funny thing here is you hear people talking a lot about their words and, and the different things that their words can bring. It said that destruction is in the mouth. But literally for Jeremiah, life and death were in his words. And uh, he had power He had power over nations and all this, but only so much as it was as he was subject to God. If he tried to just declare something, that, that, that wouldn't have happened. If he tried to say something in his own power and, and you know, whatnot, that, that obviously wouldn't have worked. Then the word of the Lord came to me asking, What do you see, Jeremiah? I replied, I see a branch of an almond tree. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I watch over my word to accomplish it. So now we're getting into the last part of chapter 1, and just be a little bit longer. And it finishes up with two visions that he sees, one of an almond tree and one of a boiling pot. So this is the first one of the almond tree. So the question became, and, and this bothered me for a long time, how the heck is seeing the branch of an almond tree doing anything to let us know that God is watching over his word to accomplish it. Well, in the Hebrew, it's actually a play on words. See, the word for almond tree and the word for watching, seked and sakad. They're, they're, they're real similar words. But there's this, so there's kind of, there's this kind of word, word play between almond tree and watching. And so it has at least three things that I've noticed, and, I'm, and I'll break them down. The first one, God, the same way as Jeremiah was watching the almond tree, God was watching the, 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 the people in the situation in order to fulfill it. But then the second way that, that this whole branch of the almond tree has anything to do with anything is that the almond tree was the first bloomer in the land of Israel. It bloomed all the way as early as January. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty early on. And uh, the leaves followed after the blooms came, not before. So as Jeremiah prophesied, that would be like the tree blooming. 
God would fulfill it, which is be, which is like the fruit or the leaves coming. But then the third way that this is a showing of how God's going to watch over it is um, the branch, the almond branch itself represented God who was watching to fulfill his word as the blooms produce fruit. So in the same way that the bloom will come forward and produce fruit, God was the almond tree watching over and he was going to produce fruit with the words. Um, obviously, though, um, in, in kind of um, Israelite Mediterranean thought, the almond tree is, is oftentimes a symbol of speedy action something that is quickly happening. So the fact that he saw an almond tree uh, obviously is very um, spurious of how quickly things would, de would descend. And imagine this, okay, all of Jeremiah, you know, this longest book in the whole Bible, takes 40 years, and that's the last 40 years of Judah. And then they were destroyed. And, you know, we're talking about mass destruction, mass slaughter. This is kind of a big deal, especially for the Jewish people. It's something that they never really got over. Um so all of chapter 1 is really an ongoing dialogue between Jeremiah and God. It starts with God saying, hey, I, I, I knew you and all this stuff. And then Jeremiah is like, hold on, that's, that's not really what, I'm, I'm, this is, I'm not really the right person. So then God gives him, gives him encouragement. And then he gives him the two visions with, with, him, with him, and, him and God talking back and forth. So also one thing that's important to notice is that God encouraged Jeremiah in the earlier days of his prophecies in ways that he didn't necessarily do later on. When, 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 when Jeremiah says, hey, you know, this is what I'm seeing, God says, hey, you have seen correctly. Like, you mean, well, hey, high five for you, you know. And uh, that's oftentimes the way that God will work. When you're new to something and in, in, infirm, God will speak to you in like in a softer way. And then as you grow, he'll kind of talk to you a little bit differently. <clears throat> so uh, we got two more sections and then we'll be done. Uh, Again, the word of the Lord came to me asking, what do you see? And I replied, I see a boiling pot. Its lip is tilted from north to the south. Then the Lord said to me, Disaster will be poured out from the north to all who live in the land. Now, this at first is a little bit complicated because in, in our thought, if you know anything about geography, Babylon is actually east of Jerusalem. So the question being, how can how can God possibly say the judgment is coming from the north? Well, in the same way that the pot was pouring from, from the direction of the north, God's wrath would be poured out in an invasion from the north. Here's the thing. So the Babylonian army went up what's called the Fertile Crescent. Um, it's, the, it's the area of the Euphrates and Tigris that goes up into Turkey, and then they marched down the Mediterranean Sea into, into Israel. So they actually came from the north. This is kind of important because... Um, let me come back to that. Yeah, I want to hold off on that. Uh, so with God calling Jeremiah... And the promise he would fulfill, God would fulfill his word, and the warning of the danger that was coming, the stage is set for the rest of the book. Everything else that's going to happen in Jeremiah has, has, has the foundation from right here. So uh, the Babylonians, they thought that they were in control, but it was God who allowed them to be the whole time. Just like every time that there's this world power who thinks that they, you know, they're so great and mighty, it doesn't really matter what world power it is. Um, God is the one who can ultimately end it in, uh, in, a, in just a moment. So indeed, I am about to summon all clans and kingdoms of the north. Now remember, I just said that Babylon was coming, so I would say all clans and kingdoms. And I'll come back to that in just a second. This is the Lord's declaration. They will come, and each king will set up his throne at the entrance to Jerusalem's gates. They will attack all her surrounding walls and all the other cities of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments against them from, for all the evil they did when they abandoned me, to burn incense to other gods and to worship the works of their own hands. So there's two fulfillments of this. The first is an immediate fulfillment. The second is a long-term fulfillment. Um, in and and the end of the age, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to set up um, set up some stuff in Jerusalem. So there's going to be the final fulfillment of this prophecy. But besides that, Babylon came, like I said, up through Syria down from the north. When Cy when when the Persians came, King Cyrus led the Persian army through up the same path down from the north. When Alexander the Great came from Greece, he came over down from the north. And then when General Pompey came from Rome, uh, he was in at war in Syria and he came down from the north. So you see it continually being fulfilled about the, about the kingdoms coming down from the north to conquer them. And obviously this climax with Jerusalem's destruction from I think uh, Titus or Titus's son, or I don't remember exactly who, um, who destroyed Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus. So that's that's obviously the long-term view of how, how that was fulfilled. But short-term, the Babylonian Empire itself was not just Babylonian people. 
It was a series of alliances that they had with a lot of different people, like the Medes, the, the Scythians. So there's all these different clans and kingdoms that are united with the Babylonians. I mean, even the Babylonians themselves, some of them were Chaldeans and some of them weren't Chaldeans. So you have all these different clans and kingdoms united as one empire known as the Babylonian Empire. So technically speaking, literally all the clans and kingdoms uh, of, of the north. So, uh, and the Medes would later join with the Persians and all that. But if you know your ancient history, there's no reason repeating it here. So, um, and then Jeremiah records how this was fulfilled in chapter 39, which, which we'll read later on, obviously, in the coming weeks. And uh, so he, he went through the, through the if, you, if you read a lot of Jeremiah, the parts, um, the historical parts that he details, he, he isn't just giving as a history book. He's recording details that fulfilled directly the prophecies. <clears throat> oh, and one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, when it says that they will destroy J uh, Jerusalem and the other cities of, Ju of Judah, that doesn't mean that each of these kingdoms that I mentioned would come and personally destroy all the cities of Jerusalem or of Israel. It means that the different cities would be destroyed at different times, and that's true. They were all destroyed at different times. Um, okay. So... Though God had a covenant with Israel, they had broken it by worshiping idols. You know, so God said, okay, I'm not going to leave you guys or forsake you. Okay, here's my co covenant with you. And they kept breaking it over and over and over again. So they, they, and they broke it in large part by worshiping idols. That was one of the big ways that they, that they broke the covenant. So, uh, so what God did is he brought punishment on Israel. And it seemed like he had forgotten his promise to stay faithful to them, even though they were unfaithful. And uh, but the thing is that even though God was bringing punishment on them, He didn't abandon them, uh, and He did still remember them and and kind of bring them back around um, after after their exile, after seventy years of exile, there was a remnant that remained. So uh, another thing I want to mention is that verse sixteen right here it says, "I will pronounce my judgments against them uh, for all the evils that they did when they abandoned me." Now obviously he's talking about Judah, you know how the way that the Israelites had 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 done that. But it could also be a reference to the other nations who God was going to judge after he had brought judgment on, on Israel, which if you read the end of, Jer end of Jeremiah, he talks about this and the judgment that would come on the other nations. And in which case, the whole them abandoning me to burn incense would be how they built idols thousands and thousands of years ago. And uh, before we go to the and go to this last section here, I wanted to mention you know that in life there's going to be a lot of things that you don't think that they are spiritual, but they actually are spiritual. Little things of of you know um, Satan trying to just get you to to give up on hope, to 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 focus on all your problems, to you know to just stop focusing on having a purpose and a plan in life, and uh, so. When you're when you're just continually discouraged, remember that uh, that the prayer is often a way forward. So the very last part of, of Jeremiah, uh, verses 17, 18, 19. Now get ready. Stand up and tell them everything that I command you. Do not be intimidated by them, or I will cause you to cower before them. Now that has multiple different meanings, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all of them. I think I have four different things that it means. So Today I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land. So he has made Jeremiah a fortified city, an iron pillar. Against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the population. So basically everyone. <laughs> they will fight against you but never prevail over you since I am with you in order to rescue you. This again, saying it time in the same chapter that he says he's going to rescue him. This is the Lord's declaration. That's how the chapter ends. So um, there's a few things. First off that I want to mention is that this is a reference right here to, to not just Deut Deuteronomy but also Joshua where it says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and very courageous. Again, that's mentioned right here. Um, if Jeremiah did not boldly obey God, God would be against him as people would be. So already he has all these different people that are against him, you know, priests and kings and, and leaders and all the populace. But if he failed to obey, then God would also be against him. So that kind of sounds a little harsh at first. So let me kind of break down what's kind of meant here. Because in Hebrew thought, it wasn't just about what you felt. It was about what you felt and acted upon. Does that kind of make sense? So uh, let me say it like this. Okay, fear is natural. Hesitancy is normal. Doubt happens in life. It's just going to happen. I intimidation will come. There's going to be times when you're intimidated. Um, but what you do with it, that is your choice. And so when he says, Jeremiah, don't be intimidated by them or I'll, I'll make you cower before them, it's not that Jeremiah wasn't supposed to feel. 
it was rather that he wasn't t supposed to give in to those feelings. You know, just because you're afraid doesn't mean you have to run. Just because you're angry doesn't mean you have to hit somebody. You know, it's a, that kind of idea. So don't allow yourself to be cow cowed before them, to be uh, su submitted to them. But continue to do what I've called you to do. Yeah, another way you could say that is in your fear, don't sin. Yeah, that would be a good, good way of saying that. Um, so uh, when you allow yourself to be intimidated by people, you will be intimidated more. And you'll find this, especially if any of you struggle with like panic attacks and stuff, there's going to be times and moments where you have to either stand your ground or allow yourself to kind of cave in to be comfortable. And if you allow yourself to, to be intimidated by people, you will find that your, your, your intimidation grows, your, your fear grows, your, your, your weakness grows. Um, it, it's something that you have to learn how to stand your ground and how to, you know, here's a great example. I used to get harassed by dogs all the time on my bike and stuff. Now, I have learned that dogs basically are looking for your posture. So now I, st I stick my chest out and I say as mean and harsh as I can, no, really loud. They, they always stop no matter how big the dog is. They stop because they're like, oh, crap, I, I don't want to mess with this guy. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. If you learn in your life a posture of constantly submitting to other people out of fear, you're going to find that the fear itself grows. Um, so w when you're avoiding conflict and making others happy, and that's your goal in life, another way of saying it is living for the praise of men, three things happen for, happen for that. First off, you're trapped in insecurity. You're never really able to, to mature. You're always like... Uh, this is why you know healthy relationships are so important because if, there, if there's a relationship where somebody's constantly berating you and trying to keep you under under your thumb, it's going to keep you in a state of insecurity. And then when that relationship finally does end, that abusive relationship finally does end, you'll be such a shamble, I guess is the word, that such a, a crumble of a person that it's nearly impossible to build yourself back up. I mean, you can do it, but it takes so freaking long. It's better just if you're with somebody who's like beating you or, or making fun of you and such. Just, Run for the hills. I mean, honestly, I, I, there's a lot of high schoolers around here who are in these relationships with these guys who, who do nothing but watch porn all day. And so then they beat up on their girls and stuff. And the girls are like, well, I can't really handle this. You know, and obviously then they're so insecure that they stick with it. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that it has to be addressed. It has to be, has to be, you have to learn how to stand your ground. So you're trapped in insecurity. Saying it off, you compromise your purpose. No matter what your purpose is in life, for Jeremiah was prophesying God's word, but no matter what your, what your purpose is in life, if you allow people to dictate that and, and you try to cow and to, to please them in order to, to, you know, to, to keep the peace, you will eventually not have a purpose in your life. If you, allow your, if you allow yourself to change your purpose to make other people happy, you will go through life just floating there. You will not achieve anything because your whole existence will just be in keeping the peace. And also, let me just kind of throw this out there. Making others happy is completely unrealistic and, and, and impossible. You can never make other people happy. If your whole life is focused on, on making other people happy, it's not going to work. And then also, avoiding conflict, that is an impossible goal. Life is conflict. It's how it works. Have you guys ever seen a tree grow and the root comes out of a rock? Life is conflict. Like it's all around us all the time. You're going to go into the Marines. Conflict. You're going to go have this job where you have to travel around. Conflict. Everything that you have in life, it's going to be conflict. You're, uh, Isaiah, you said that you want to try and get a part-time job. Conflict. You're going to have people who don't like you. You're going to have people who talk crap. You're going to have people where you're going to have to learn how to, in a loving way, still not allow them to push you around. You know what I mean? Like... Where you're push your, pressured into stuff where, where you shouldn't be. And then the third thing that, 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 that's going to cause a problem with this, you're trapped in insecurity, you compromise your purpose, you're, you're going to be distraught all the time and just in complete despair and depression because you're, you're trying to achieve something that's not possible. You're made your whole life trying to, trying to get the approval of other people, but it will never be enough. It won't be enough for you. It won't be enough for them. If you guys have ever seen the movie Encanto, right, where she's going off on her gram and she's all, um, you... Uh, uh, what's her face? The strong one will never be strong enough for you. Oh, she'll never be perfect enough for you. And it's that kind of kind of, kind of an idea. Um, so okay. Uh, so if you allow others to decide your obedience to God, you will you will also learn fear. You can't allow other people to decide your um, your level of obedience to God. Well, I don't want this to happen. I'm afraid that this will happen. So just <laughs> obey God and let the chips fall where they may. Um, so it's, there's an interesting, you could call it juxtaposition or, or contrast, whatever you want to say, that, going on here between Jeremiah and Israel. So at the same time that God's saying, hey, disaster's coming on Israel, Israel is going to be conquered, they're going to be destroyed. At the exact same time that he's saying that, he's saying, Jeremiah, you will not be conquered. Look at what he just said after saying about how there's, how there's, how there's this judgment coming out of the north, how there's destruction coming from the north. He says, 
But I am the one who has made uh, today. I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land. So even as this whole this whole land is 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 going to crumble and fall apart, you are going to be st steadfast and firm. And who's going to be opposing him? Kings, <laughs> officials, priests, the entirety of the population. Everyone would be against Jeremiah. Literally, you know, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. Literally, <laughs> nobody likes you, Jeremiah. Uh, but they wouldn't win. They wouldn't win because God would be on Jeremiah's side. He would face these hard times. He would have these people opposing him, but it wasn't hopeless. And really, that's 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 something that we all, as Christians, need to know. That, yes, things are going to oftentimes be hopeless, but, um, you know, God God is going to be with you the whole time, and, and you're, you're, you're destined to succeed because Jesus put it like this. They can only kill you and nothing more. So don't be the, don't be afraid of the ones who can kill your flesh. Be afraid of the one who can kill your kill your spirit eternally. He didn't say it like that, so I'm kind of obviously saying it wrong. Not your spirit eternally, but send, you know, send you to the second judgment. Anyways, uh, so in large part, though, feelings are controlled by beliefs and actions. Like, let's say you're having panic attacks, so you get out. There's the action, and you start thinking differently. Your belief and your action, and that changes how you how you deal with things like panic attacks. So I hope that this this kind of helps you see how Jeremiah relates to us. And um, if you would like to just kind of be a, a, ahead of the curve for next week, um, I would encourage you to read Jeremiah chapter 2 and 3. So that way um, you'll kind of know a little bit more what's going on. And maybe even, uh, where's the pointer? Oh, there it is. And maybe even, uh, there it is. Um, the second half of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles.